let's stick on the N1 implant itself. So the thing that's in the brain. Uh, so I'm looking at a picture of it. There's an enclosure. Uh, there's a charging coil. So we didn't talk about the charging, which is fascinating. Uh, the, the, the battery, the power electronics, the antenna. Uh, then there's the signal processing electronics. I wonder if there's more kinds of signal processing you can do. That's that's another that's another question. And then there's the threads themselves with the enclosure on the bottom. So maybe to ask about the charging. So yeah. there's a external charging device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an external charging device. Um, so yeah, the the second part of the implant, the threads are the ones again, just the the last three to five millimeters are the ones that are actually penetrating the cortex. Yeah. Uh, rest of it is, actually most of the volume is occupied by the battery, uh, rechargeable battery. Um, and uh, you know it's about a size of a quarter. Uh, you know, I actually have a device here if you wanna take a look at it. Um, you know, this is the, the flexible thread component of it. Wow. And then this is the implant. So it's about a size of a US quarter. Um, it's about nine millimeter thick. So basically this implant, uh, you know, once you have the craniectomy and the, and the directomy, um, threads are inserted and um, the, the hole that you created, this craniectomy gets replaced with that. So basically that thing plugs that hole and you can screw in uh, these self-drilling cranial screws to hold it in place. And at the end of the day, once you have the skin flap over, uh, there's only about two to three millimeters that's you know obviously transitioning off of the top of the implant to where the screws are, and and that's the minor bump that you have. Those threads look tiny. That's incredible. That is really incredible. That is really incredible. And also, as you're right, most of the volume, actual volume, is the battery. Yeah. Wow. This is way smaller than I realized. They they are also the threads themselves are quite strong. They look strong. And and the. Th Thread themselves also has a very interesting um, feature at the end of it called the loop. And that's the mechanism to which the robot is able to interface and manipulate this tiny hair-like structure. And they're tiny. So what's the width of a thread? Yeah, so the, the width of a thread um, starts from 16 micron and then tapers out to about 84 micron. So, you know, average human hair is about 80 to 100 micron in width. This thing is amazing. This thing is amazing. Yes, yeah, so most of the volume is occupied by the by the battery, rechargeable lithium ion cell. Um, and uh, the charging is done through inductive charging, which is actually very commonly used. You know, your cell phone, most cell phones have that. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest difference is that, you know, for us, you know, usually when you have a phone and you wanna charge it on a charging pad, you don't really care how hot it gets. Whereas in for us, it matters. There's a very strict regulation and good reasons to not actually increase the surrounding tissue temperature by two degrees Celsius. So there's actually a lot of innovation that is packed into this to allow charging of this implant without causing that temperature threshold to reach. And even small things like you see this charging coil and what's called a ferrite shield, right? So. Uh, without that ferrous shield, what you end up having when you have um, you know, resonant inductive charging is that the battery itself is a metallic can and you form these eddy currents uh, from uh, external charger and that causes heating um, and that actually contributes to inefficiency in charging. Um, so this ferrite shield, what it does is that it actually concentrate that field line away from the battery and then around the coil that's actually wrapped around it. There's a lot of really fascinating design here to to make it, I mean, you're integrating a computer into a biological, a complex biological system. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation here. I would say that part of what enabled this was just the innovations in the wearable. Uh, there's a lot of really, really powerful, tiny, low power uh, microcontrollers, temperature sensors or various different sensors and power electronics. A lot of innovation really came in, the, the charging coil design, how this is packaged and how do you enable charging such that you don't really 
uh, exceed that temperature limit, which is not a constraint for other devices out there. So let's talk about the threads themselves, those tiny, tiny, tiny things. So uh, how many of them are there? You mentioned a thousand electrodes. How many threads are there? And what do the electrodes have to do with the threads? Yeah, so the current instantiation of the device has 64 threads, and each thread has 16 electrodes for a total of 1,024 electrodes that are capable of both recording and stimulating. Um, and um, the thread is basically this uh, polymer insulated wire. Um, the metal conductor is the kind of a tiramisu, tiramisu cake of uh, Thai plat, gold plat Thai. Um, um, and they're very, very tiny wires, um, two micron in width, so two one millionth of a uh, meter. It's crazy that that thing I'm looking at has the polymer insulation, has the conducting material, and has 16 electrodes at the end of it. On each of those threads. Yeah, on each of those threads. Correct. 16, each one of yes, those. Yes, you're not gonna be able to see it with naked eyes. And I, I mean, to state the obvious, or maybe for people who are just listening, they're flexible. Yes, yes. That's also one element that uh, was incredibly important for us. Um, so each of these thread are, as I mentioned, 16 micron in width, and then they taper to 84 micron, but in thickness, they're less than five micron. Mm -hmm. um, and in thickness is mostly, you know, a polyimid at the bottom and this metal track, and then another polyimid. So two micron of polyimid, 400 nanometer of this metal stack and two micron of polyimid sandwiched together to protect it from the environment that is uh, 37 degrees C bag of salt water. So what, what's some, maybe, can you speak to some interesting aspects of the material design here? Like what does it take to, to design a thing like this and to be able to manufacture a thing like this uh, for people who don't know anything about this kind of thing. Yeah, so the material selection that we have is not, I don't think it was particularly unique. Um, there, there were other labs and there are other labs that are kind of looking at similar um, material stack. Um, there's kind of a fundamental question um, and, and still needs to be answered around the longevity and reliability of these uh, microelectrodes um, that, that we call, uh, compared to some of the other more conventional neural interfaces, devices that are intracranial, so penetrating the cortex, that are more rigid, um, you know, like the Utah ray, um, that, that are these uh, four by four millimeter kind of silicon shank that have exposed uh, recording site at the end of it. Um, and, and um, you know, that's that's been kind of the innovation from Richard Norman back in 1997. Uh, it's called the Utah Ray because, you know, he was at University of Utah. And what, what does the Utah Ray look like? So it's a rigid type of... Yeah, of so we can actually look it up. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bed of needle. Um, there's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, go yeah, ahead, I'm so sorry. Th those are rigid, rigid, <laughs> rigid shank. Rigid, um, yeah, you weren't and, kidding. And the size and the number of shanks vary anywhere from 64 to 128. Um, at the very tip of it is an exposed electrode that actually records neural signal. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note is that uh, unlike neural link threads that have recording electrodes that are actually exposed iridium oxide recording sites along the depth, this is only at a single depth. So mm -hmm. these Utah ray spokes can be anywhere between 0.5 millimeters to 1.5 millimeter. And they also have uh, designs that are slanted. Um, so you can have it inserted at different depth. Um, but that's one of the other big differences. And then, uh, I mean, the main key difference is the fact that uh, there's no active electronics. These are just electrodes. And then there's a bundle of a wire that you're seeing. And then that actually then exits the craniectomy. Um, that then has this port that you can connect to um, for any external electronic devices. They are working on a, or have the wireless telemetry device, but it still requires a through the skin uh, port that actually is one of the biggest failure modes for infection uh, for the system. What are some of the challenges associated with flexible threads? Like for example, on the robotic side, R1, uh, implanting those threads how difficult is that task? 
Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, they're they're very very difficult to maneuver by hand. Um, these these youth arrays that you you saw uh, earlier, uh, they're actually inserted by a neurosurgeon actually positioning it mm -hmm. near the site that they want, and then uh, they're actually <laughs> there's a pneumatic hammer that actually pushes them in. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's a it's a pretty simple process, um, and they're easy to maneuver. Um, but for for these thin film arrays, they're they're very very tiny and uh, flexible, so they're they're very difficult to maneuver. So that that's why we built an entire robot <laughs> to do that. Um, and there are other other reasons for why we built the robot, um, and and that is ultimately we want this to help millions and millions of people that can benefit from this, and there just aren't that many neurosurgeons out there, um, and uh, you know robots can be uh, something that. You know, we hope can actually do large parts of the surgery, um, but yeah, yeah. The the, the robot is this entire other um, sort of category of product that we're working on, and it, it's essentially this multi-axis gantry system that has the specialized robot head um, that has all of the optics and. Um, this this kind of a needle retracting mechanism that maneuvers these these threads um, via this loop structure that you have on the thread. So the thread already has a loop structure by which you can grab it. Correct. Okay. Correct. So this is fascinating. So you mentioned optics. So there's a robot R1. So for now, there's a human that actually creates uh, a hole in the mm -hmm. skull, and then after that. There's a computer vision component that's finding a way to avoid the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And then you're grabbing it by the loop, each individual thread, and placing it in a particular location to avoid the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And also choosing the depth of placement, all that Correct. kind of stuff. So controlling every, like the 3D geometry of the placement. Correct. So the, the aspect of this robot that is unique is that it's not surgeon assisted or human assisted, it's a semi-automatic or automatic uh, robot once you, you know, obviously there are human component to it when you're placing targets. Um, you can always move it or, away from kind of major vessels that you see. Um, but I mean, we wanna get to a point where one click and it just does the surgery within minutes. So the computer vision component finds great targets, mm -hmm. candidates, and mm -hmm. the human kind of approves them. And the robot does. Is it, does it do like one thread at a time, or does it do? It does one thread at a time, uh, and that's that's actually also one thing that we um, uh, are looking at ways to do multiple threads at a time. There's nothing stopping from it. You can have multiple kind of engagement uh, mechanisms, um, but right now it's one by one. And uh, you know, we also still do quite a bit of just just kind of verification to make sure that it got inserted. If so, how deep? You know, did it actually match? Um, what was programmed in, and you know, so on and so forth. And the, the actual electrodes are placed at very at differing depths. In the uh, like, I mean, it's very small differences, but differences. Yeah, yeah. And so that there's some reasoning behind that, as you mentioned, like it it gets more varied signal. Yeah, we. I mean, we try to place them all around three or four millimeter from the surface, um, just because the span of the electrode, those 16 electrodes that we currently have in this uh, version, spans um, you know, roughly around three millimeters. So we wanna get all of those in the brain. This is fascinating. Okay, so there's a million questions here. If we go zoom in specifically on the electrodes, so what is your sense? How many neurons is each individual electrode listening to? Yeah, each electrode can record from anywhere between zero to 40. As I mentioned, right mm -hmm. earlier, um, but <laughs> practically speaking, uh, we only see about at most like two to three, um, and you can actually distinguish which neuron it's coming from by the shape of the spikes. Oh, cool. um, so I mentioned the spike detection algorithm that we have. Mm -hmm. It's called the Boss algorithm, uh, <laughs> buffer <laughs> online spike sorter. <laughs> nice. It actually outputs at the end of the day, uh, six unique values, which are, um, you know, kind of the amplitude of these like negative going hump, middle hump, like uh, positive going hump, and then also the time at which these happen. And from that, you can have, uh, 
a kind of a statistical probab probability um, estimation of, is that a spike, is it not a spike? And then based on that, you could also uh, determine, oh, that spike looks different than that spike, must come from a different neuron. Okay, so that that's a nice signal processing step from which you can then make much better predictions about if there's a spike, yeah. especially in this kind of context where there could be multiple neurons yeah. screaming. And that that also results in you being able to compress the data better. Yeah. In the center day. Okay. That's and, and just to be clear, I mean, there, the the labs do this what's called spike sorting. Um, usually, once you have these like broadband, you know, like the, the fully digitized signals, and then you run a bunch of different set of al algorithms to kind of tease apart. It, it's just all of this for us is done on the device. On the device. In a very low power, custom, you know built ASIC, a digital processing unit. Highly heat constrained. Highly heat constrained. And the processing time from signal going in and giving you the output is less than a microsecond, which is uh, you know a very, very short amount of time. Oh yeah, so the latency has to be super short. Correct. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a pain in the ass. Yeah, latency really is a uh, huge, huge thing that you have to deal with. Uh, right now, the biggest source of latency comes from the Bluetooth. Uh, the the way in oh. which they're packetized and you know we bin them in 15 millisecond. Oh, interesting. Uh, time so it's communication constraint. Is there some potential innovation there on the protocol used? Absolutely. But, okay. Yeah, Bluetooth is definitely not uh, our final uh, wireless communication <laughs> protocol that we want to get to. It's a highly hence, hence the N1 and the R1. <laughs> I imagine that increases and NX, we'll NX RX. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's you know, the communication protocol, because Bluetooth uh, allows you to communicate against farther distances than you need to, so you can go much shorter. Yeah, the only, uh, well, the primary motivation for choosing Bluetooth is that, I mean, everything has Bluetooth. All right, so you um, can talk so to any device. Interoperability is just absolutely essential, especially in this early phase. Um, and in many ways, if you can access a phone or a computer, you can do anything. <laughs> 